This film contains statements startling in their implications, but all are well documented. Where recordings were available, the actual voices are used. A narrator speaks the words for statements that were written rather than spoken, or when recordings were not available. The motion picture you're about to see does not concern itself with the social or civil rights of American citizens or with the economic or social problems of American cities. It was produced to warn citizens of the nature of a revolutionary force affiliating itself openly with aims of international communism and now active throughout our nation in a planned offensive to destroy the American system and seize control of the United States. July 1967, Newark, New Jersey. Burning, looting, shooting, overthrowing the law and order of America. Looks like you're uh, moving out there. I'm forced to do so. After 18 years being in one locale, I'm forced to get out. But I knew this was coming because on the 13th, Thursday the 13th, I noticed strange men coming on the street with a pad marking everything down. The, the buildings, the stores that were easily able to get into, those with gates and those without gates. Those that had good merchandise, those that had just any merchandise, and they were well prepared. At the height of the rioting, sniping, and burning in Newark, Governor of New Jersey Richard J. Hughes was interviewed. You think the cry of black power uh, might have added a little fuel to this? Undoubtedly. Detroit, Michigan. Police, firemen, National Guard, and U.S. troops were fired upon by snipers, firing from rooftops and windows. Some were killed. Thousands of rioters joined in the assaults with clubs and bricks and Molotov cocktails. Louis Lomax, prominent Negro journalist who covered the Detroit riots and investigated their causes, wrote in the Detroit News that forces from outside Detroit sent squads of college-age black power agents into the city's Negro community 30 days ahead of the riots to agitate Negroes and create an explosive atmosphere. They posed as magazine salesmen, Mr. Lomax reported. Al Dunmore, the respected editor of Detroit's Negro newspaper, the Michigan Chronicle, was interviewed. Do you feel that there's any pattern or any conspiracy behind the riot that we've had in our major cities this year? I really feel that there is an organized conspiracy which is both national and has some international involvement. I feel this. And uh, I have reasons to be almost certain. In 1967, 126 cities were hit by racial violence with 75 incidents classified as major riots. At least 117 persons were killed, more than 2,000 injured. Total cost, including property damage and other economic losses, 
$665 million. Was this massive exercise in anarchy a rehearsal for civil war and revolution? The chairman of the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Internal Security, Senator James Eastland, answers the question. The drive for Negro revolution in this country is moving toward a climax. The forces which shaped, molded, and influenced this drive, and which now, to a very substantial extent, control it, have plans which involve major racial disturbances of riot proportions in some 20 cities of this country. The primary objective is acquisition of power by the communists. In the long-range view, this objective keys in with the communist purpose of overthrowing the government of the United States. H. Rapp Brown, national chairman of the Revolutionary Students' Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, confirms the reality of revolution. Here he is speaking at the height of the 1967 race riots in film footage not hitherto seen by the American public. We stand on the eve of a black revolution, brothers. Masses of our people are in the street. They're fighting tit for tat, tooth for tooth. An eye for an eye and a life for a life. The rebellions that we see are merely dress rehearsals for the revolution that's to come. We better get ourselves some guns and prepare ourselves. Stokely Carmichael, the new messiah of revolutionary black power, boldly sets forth the objective. This struggle is not a reformist movement which aspires to become a part of the United States. It is a struggle of total revolution. For more than 35 years, international communism, whose historic goal is the overthrow of the United States and the seizure of dictatorial dominion over all mankind, has been working among minority groups in America, particularly at Negro Americans, Puerto Rican Americans, and Mexican Americans. The vast majority of American Negroes, together with Americans of all races and creeds, have rejected the blandishments of communism. But today, world communism has established a beachhead here of mammoth revolutionary capability. And revolutionary black power has arisen as the vanguard. Our American system is in great danger. The United States is being hemmed in ever more menacingly by a world communist force which rapidly is overtaking our military supremacy. On the ground, in the air, in the oceans of the world, and in cataclysmic space warfare. And now the historic communist strategy of creating a revolutionary force within the United States becomes a looming reality. Since international communism first showed its evil, aggressive face to the world, strident voices in America have declared there is no danger and never was a communist danger internally within the United States. Millions of Americans have hearkened to this dangerous delusion while communism relentlessly expanded its powers here. Its blueprint for conquest now clearly includes an assault on American institutions from within, mob violence, guerrilla warfare, massive disruptive strife. Then, finally, undoubtedly, a climactic military move, simultaneously from within and without, to crush and take over a disrupted and weakened nation. The entire communist communications network gives clear evidence of unified planning toward such a climax. Here is the National Guardian issue of March 16, 1968. The National Guardian is listed by congressional committees as a communist front publication which has manifested itself from the beginning as a virtual official propaganda arm of Soviet Russia. This issue of The Guardian reports to its leftist subscribers throughout the nation that radical organizations of Mexican-Americans are beginning to join forces with revolutionary black power. The same issue reports that militant Puerto Rican groups are joining with revolutionary black power elements. The so-called poor white are being constantly agitated. Communists are active in efforts to organize them into a force that would ultimately join in the revolution to overthrow the United States. Revolutionary black power accepts its role as the vanguard of the revolution. This issue of the Guardian shows the way toward control of the federal government. 
Ultimately, black power here means that the black people will decide under what conditions the federal government can function. And before black power ever gets to that stage, violent outbreaks could seriously threaten the day-to-day -day operations of the government. A rebellion in Washington could be the equivalent of the recent guerrilla attack on the U.S. Embassy complex in Saigon. The communist worker, now expanded into a widely distributed daily linked to international headquarters in Moscow, carried the Black Power Revolutionary Line as set forth officially by James Foreman, SNCC official and lieutenant to Stokely Carmichael. In this speech to 5,000 Negro college students in California and published in the Communist Worker, Foreman said of the revolution, the dispossessed unite with the dispossessed. The dispossessed in the United States are the people of African descent, the Puerto Ricans, the Mexican Americans, and many poor white. We are the vanguard of that group. Whether we will live up to our historical role and lead forward that revolution remains to be seen. We must be prepared to fight and die, and we must believe that we will win. Only from the masses of the black people will there come revolutionary leadership. The communist worker endorsed the foreman call for revolution. The red newspaper viewed it as a fighting call for liberation, a war of liberation. Following the summer of terror which he had helped to create, Stokely Carmichael went to Havana, Cuba to discuss revolutionary tactics and guerrilla warfare with communist officialdom from throughout three hemispheres. In a speech to the Red Comrades, he made it clear that not reform, but the destruction of America is the goal. Comrades of the Third World, of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, I want you to know that the Afro-Americans in the United States are fighting for their liberation and that this struggle is not a reformist movement which aspires to become a part of the United States. It is a struggle of total revolution in which we intend to change the imperialist, capitalist, and racist structures of the United States. We have no other alternative but to take arms and fight for our total liberation and for a total revolution in the United States. Mr. Carmichael welded revolutionary black power to world communism with this statement. Our struggle will be one and the same with world communism. Our struggles should be coordinated. It is high time that we join our forces. We are ready to begin today to destroy from within the structures that have oppressed us all. And we hope that you will begin to destroy them also from the outside. Let us march forward. We shall win. Carmichael's particular hero is the late Che Guevara, communist master of guerrilla warfare. Guevara's textbook of tactics on revolutionary overthrow by guerrilla forces has become a primary textbook of revolutionary black power in America. In this official communist newspaper, Grandma, published in communist Cuba, Carmichael eulogizes Guevara and pledges as a comrade to carry on the world revolution. With the death of Ernesto Che Guevara, it is our revolutionary duty to create Vietnams inside the United States. Che explained clearly that there is no need to talk more, that the contradictions in the world are clear, and that the time has come for each to take his place in the fight. This is exactly what Malcolm X said. The time for words has passed. Now is the time to fight. Che Guevara died the way we all should die, fighting imperialism, weapons in hand. His example, like that of Patrice Lumumba, spurs us on in the fight and gives us strength to continue this struggle, which we shall win. They died fighting, and we, from now on, will also die fighting. At a press conference before leaving Havana, Carmichael said, We are moving toward urban guerrilla warfare within the United States. Repeatedly, Carmichael called for a communist victory in Vietnam and otherwise allied himself and his black power forces with world communism's goals. And in Paris, just before returning to America, Carmichael said, Our movement is to move to disrupt the structure of the United States, and our blood will pay for that, and we think it is not too high a price to pay for such revolutionary fervor today is widespread among Carmichael's widening force of followers. Rap Brown is a past master of incitation. You better define who your enemy is, and you better move to destroy your enemy. 
Because if America don't come round, America should be burnt down. Now, when you decide who your enemy is, you see, I told him when I went down to be inducted. I said, if you give me a gun and tell me to shoot my enemy, I might shoot Lady Bird. Malcolm X, the one-time black Muslim, became in death the martyred hero of revolutionary black power. He preached arming of blacks, his term for Negroes, and a fight to the death to seize America. He said, Revolutions are never waged singing, we shall overcome. Revolutions are based on bloodshed. Revolutions overturn systems. Elijah Muhammad, black Muslim leader, predicts that white rule in the United States will be overthrown by 1970. Although the vast majority of Negro Americans are fundamentally law-abiding, loyal and patriotic citizens in spite of historic grievances, they are sensitive, as are white people, to emotional stimulation and to some degree of control through mass psychology in which the communists are past masters. White revolutionaries have joined in some of black power's revolutionary goals most vital to international communism, such as support to the communist Viet Cong in the war against American forces in Vietnam, and particularly in organizing so-called student power forces to take over American colleges and universities. Jerry Rubin, one of the white revolutionaries working on behalf of victory for the communist Viet Cong, reveals plans for coordinating the forces of radical white youth with those of black power. The goal is a massive white revolutionary youth movement, which, working in parallel cooperation with rebellions in the black communities, could seriously disrupt this country. The United States will find itself faced with rebellions from 15 different directions. In a symposium sponsored by the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions at Santa Barbara, California, a group of young revolutionaries, including presidents of student bodies in some of America's biggest universities, viewed their role in the revolution thus. I'm going to say loudly and explicitly what I mean by revolution. What I mean by revolution is overthrowing the American government and American imperialism and installing some sort of decentralized power in this country. I'll tell you the steps that I think will be needed. First of all, starting up, 50 Vietnams in third world countries. This is going to come about by black rebellions in our cities, joined by some white people. People in universities can do a number of things to help. They have access to money, and they can give these people guns, which I think they should do. They can engage in acts of terrorism and sabotage outside the ghetto. The words of Devereux Kennedy, president of the student body at Washington University, St. Louis. Facts were given at the symposium indicating that about 10% of students in American colleges on the average follow such revolutionary leadership, and that revolutionaries hold about 50% of the presidencies of college student bodies throughout the country. These developing revolutionary forces and their coordination of planning with the communist-guided black power leadership were ignored by the Presidential Commission on Civil Disorders. The nationally syndicated columnist, Victor Rizal, who for years has been warning of communist power at work within America, wrote that the commission in its report would fail to publicly reveal evidence that a conspiracy is operating within America to whip up bloody flaming riots. And that money from communist Cuba is being poured into hundreds of revolutionary cells in Negro communities across the nation to plan, mobilize, and carry out violence. Mr. Rizal said in his column, All this will not be found in the commission's formal report, but the private warning to President Johnson nonetheless is grim, and it contradicts published statements that there was no conspiracy behind the riots of 1967. In the face of the overwhelming evidence of the true nature of revolutionary black power and its link to world communism, the President's Commission on Civil Disorders has been charged with ignoring vital facts while telling the nation that there are no organized elements at work in planning the massive civil strife. The commission declared that black power groups seek only long-needed reforms within America's social and economic structure.
The full thrust of revolution voiced by Carmichael and the comrades in Havana and elsewhere was in effect suppressed by the commission. Dr. J.H. Jackson, head of the largest Negro church organization in America, the National Baptist Convention USA, with nearly seven million members, has warned constantly that communists are directing the revolutionary activities of the radical black power elements within America. Here is his statement concerning the Presidential Commission's report. In spite of the statement from the Kerner report that they had found no conspiracy in studying the riots of 1967, I am convinced with others that there is a conspiracy, deep and dangerous, designed to demoralize the nation, to divide it, and if possible, to conquer it. In reaching its published conclusion that no planning went into the riots, the commission apparently ignored the Michigan Crime Commission report on the biggest of the 75 major riots of 1967, the one in Detroit, which created eight days of terror in late July. The Michigan Crime Commission, after a far-reaching study, said, Evidence has disclosed that many persons spontaneously participated in the Detroit riot at its various stages and for reasons not necessarily related. It is becoming clear, however, that certain organized elements seeking to expand and exploit a civil disturbance engaged in extensive planning and preparation to enable them to seize upon what otherwise may have been a limited incident of public disorder. Los Angeles Mayor Sam Yorty was questioned on Meet the Press. The commission's, the, the president's report here says that it found no evidence of a conspiracy behind the riots of this last year. Uh, when you testified in Congress, I believe you said that you thought there were, there were evidence of uh, a conspiracy of communist groups infiltrating and so forth. I didn't say I thought, I know there are. So you... I think every mayor of a big city has intelligence services. Uh, and we know that there are protest type uh, demonstrations uh, sometimes coordinated all over the world on the same day and their intentions are uh, to try and cause riots. Uh, many organizations are openly uh, in the field and communist backed. They're trying to take advantage of the situation that exists to worsen it rather than try to solve it. What are the names of one of those, Mr. Yorty? Well, RAM, so-called RAMs, Revolutionary Action Movement. There's no question about some of their connections, and they certainly don't disguise what their intentions are. And we are very concerned about the type of armament that they may have now. Robert F. Williams, Negro revolutionary who fled to communist Cuba when the FBI sought to arrest him after a kidnapping in North Carolina, is recognized within the revolutionary black power apparatus as the prime minister in exile. He formed one of the most vicious of the storm troops, R.A.M., called RAM, meaning Revolutionary Action Movement. This is the organization mentioned by Mayor Yorty. From his operational bases in Red China and Havana, Williams has constantly agitated America's 22 million Negroes and has become a tactician within the communist empire, guiding the black power leaders. In his strategy and tactics newsletter, The Crusader, Williams says, A few years of violence, sporadic and highly destructive uprisings will set the stage for the grand finale. After the stage is properly set through protracted struggle, racist and imperialist America could be brought to her knees in 90 days of highly organized fighting, sabotage, and a massive firestorm. The massive firestorms have already been rehearsed in Detroit, Newark, and 73 other cities. After the burning and rioting and plundering and the mob assaults upon law and order, Williams wrote in the Crusader, which is smuggled into America and distributed by the thousands to black power forces, this time I write with certain knowledge and facts derived from Watts, Chicago, Newark, Detroit, Milwaukee, and more than a hundred other places. Could a minority revolution succeed in America? It most certainly could. Our people must further develop and master people's warfare. Rap Brown certainly agrees with Williams, and he suggests that Negroes who work in the homes of white people could aid the revolution by poisoning their food. Folks run around here talking about we, me, we in majority, we can't win. They forget. Black folks is, are in some of the most strategic places in the country. We work in their kitchens. <laughs> They think, they think they having trouble out to Viet Cong. They ain't even eating from what he cooks. Yeah. You let war start over here, we're going to teach you about guerrilla warfare. 
Yeah. Because the way you immobilize a police force is that you put arson in his food at night. See, and he don't make it there in the morning. <laughs> Philadelphia police raided Ram headquarters in that city after uncovering a Ram plot to start a riot and then poison hundreds of policemen by putting deadly potassium cyanide in the coffee that would be served police in emergency soup kitchens. Among the revolutionary documents seized were copies of a secret Black Guard organizer's manual. The manual is a very crude but revealing document which gives explicit instructions for the mobilization and training of neighborhood, citywide, and statewide units of a Black Army of Liberation. This army would serve as the vanguard of the revolution to seize control of the United States. Units already are in training in cities throughout America. The dictatorial power over this sprawling revolutionary force rests in the hands of a secret soul council, secret even to the brothers. But in the secret organizer's manual, the top commissar is identified as Brother Rob, Robert F. Williams, from Communist Havana and Communist Peking. Here is the November 1967 issue of Esquire magazine. It published an article by William Worthy, Negro writer, entitled, The American Negro is Dead. Mr. Worthy says the American Negro is dead and risen as a black man of the world, sole brother of non-whites everywhere. Don't look now, honky, meaning white man, but some of his best friends are Viet Cong. Let's read a paragraph. Negroes increasingly see black power as not confined to ghetto rebellions, but rather as a part of a general fight of the oppressed against the oppressor all over the world. Indeed, there is a wealth of evidence to suggest that what began as a domestic civil rights movement has turned of late into a global drive, at the center of which are the now allied struggles of the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam and the American Negro. The Viet Cong is not the enemy of black people. They have lied to black people and told black people that we are over there to prevent the spread of communist aggression. You better fight the spread of democracy, brother. That's what you better fight. People don't want democracy over there, not the type that America practices. Esquire magazine, in its March 1968 issue, carried this article, further warning of the true nature of the mobilizing black power revolution, calling it the Second Civil War. Here is one of the revolutionaries identified in the Esquire article. Imari, born Richard Henry a black power advocate who argues that the doctrine of one more chance honky is outdated. His revolutionary plans include a mass black migration to enclaves in the South, where, with protection of red Chinese submarines in the Gulf of Mexico, the fighting could begin in earnest. Doubters should be aware that Imari, a Detroit ghetto leader, admits there was advanced planning in the Motown Detroit riot. Genocide, he believes, is just around the corner. A group headquartered in Detroit calling itself the Malcolm X Society spearheads a movement to demand that five states in the South, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, and South Carolina, be given over in their entirety to the black power forces. A separate government for Negroes would be set up. All whites would be evicted. This is the first step development for which communism has agitated since Stalin sent his personal envoy, Joseph Pagani, to America 35 years ago to begin recruiting Negroes into the communist apparatus. Writing in the magazine Communist, volume 7, number 10, Pagani, whose party name in America was John Pepper, gave these instructions to Negro communists. The Communist Party recognizes the tremendous revolutionary possibilities of the Negro people. The Negro Communist should emphasize the establishment in America of a Negro Soviet Republic. Later, National Communist Chairman Earl Browder, in this booklet, further sketched out the strategy. Foremost authorities on communist strategy and tactics point out that the Negro Communists, with the revolutionary black power leadership, are communists first and Negro Revolutionary is second. This is indicated by their constant threat to kill moderate Negroes whom they designate as Toms, meaning those who do not join the revolution. Negro communists loyally follow the discipline of world communist tacticians 
who historically have sought to ignite powder kegs among the Negro masses in America for the primary purpose of disrupting the nation and advancing the world communist revolution. Carmichael and his lieutenants cry out loudest for the destruction of American capitalism and what they call American imperialism. This has become the war cry of revolutionary black power, down with capitalism and American imperialism. It has been the historic slogan of world communism for a half century. Intelligence operators in police departments in the major United States cities report record purchases of guns by Negroes and record numbers of burglaries of gun stores. That should be more shooting than looting. That's the only thing I agree with. Black folks trying to loot when they should be shooting. If you're going to loot, loot your gun store. Dig it? <laughs> Brother, because the only reason that the honky did not go into Plainfield and wantonly destroy and kill people was because the brothers were armed. They had 46 automatic weapons. Each one of those weapons would shoot 9,000 times in chunk of bricks for half hours. The Negro journalist Louis Lomax wrote in his syndicated column, Black America is busy stockpiling weapons, not merely bullets and rifles, but bazookas, machine guns, and grenades. The ghettos of virtually every major city are being prepared for war by black militants. Those police forces that have bought armored cars and tanks will learn that the black militants' arsenals contain armor-piercing shells. Such sophisticated armament undoubtedly is coming to the black power revolutionaries from Red Cuba. The nationally syndicated columnists Rowland Evans and Robert Novak declared there is no longer any doubt that SNCC today is Fidel Castro's arm in the United States. The task of Stokely Carmichael after his visits with communist strategists in Hanoi, Algiers, Egypt, France, Czechoslovakia, Guinea, Havana and other red bastions was the formation of a united front of all black power groups in the nation. The united front is an historical communist tactical instrument of revolution. Some of the people or organizations drawn into a united front may not be dedicated to the communist objective of violent overthrow, but surely none can be ignorant of the fact that communists ultimately dominate any united front which they help to establish. Though the Presidential Commission, the U.S. Attorney General and the White House combined in either discounting or altogether rejecting the communist coloration of revolutionary black power, the documented facts clearly expose it as a deadly threat to America's survival, an urgent danger within. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI and one of the most respected government officials, expresses grave anxiety. Black power promoted by the demagogic exhortations of Stokely Carmichael, H. Rapp Brown, and others of their ilk has created a climate of unrest and has come to mean to many Negroes the power to riot, burn, loot, and kill. This black power development in the racial field is tailor-made for the Communist Party USA. The communists have sown the seeds of discord and hope to reap in 1968, a year filled with explosive racial unrest. Today our country faces the most severe test ever to confront a free people. The frantic effort of the Communist Party to subvert our youth and to wrest control of the Negro movement for Negro rights clearly indicate that our enemies feel that the end of our empire is very near. If our nation is to protect itself from the disastrous events being planned by the Communists and their allies, working within the Negro community and in other ways, the American people, millions of them, black and white, must work together to re-establish the rule of law and order in our cities, on college campuses, and throughout the country. The revolution underway in America must be stamped out now. We must maintain in Washington a Congress that will understand the true nature of the communist peril within and build stronger legal safeguards against subversion. We must demand that our highest governmental leadership in the White House recognize the communist enemy, both abroad and within our midst. The full power of law enforcement must be brought to bear, and it must be brought to bear without the restraints imposed by political expediency. 
communists working to destroy our nation must be outlawed. Promoters of burning, looting, mob violence, and killing must be subjected to the full penalty of protective law. Plotters of black power revolution as the vanguard of a violent communist takeover and those who give aid and comfort to our enemy wherever he exists must be recognized as traitors and dealt with accordingly. This is a challenge to citizenship. To turn back communism and survive as a nation, at least 50 million Americans, black and white, Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, must enlist in a counter force acting as citizens individually and in concert with others to arouse our nation and its leadership to the grave dangers threatening our internal security, our survival, and the heritage that has made America free.